Welcome to the Think Fitness Life podcast, Mindset, Exercise, and Nutrition. We are three personal trainers, health coaches, fitness nerds, all the above, dedicated to providing information in these realms to promote critical thinking and assist people in their life practice. My name is Matt Glockman, and as always with me are my co-hosts, Eric Menchie and Mike Urso. Howdy ho! And the first one was Eric, and the second one was Mike. We like to explore topics related to mindset, exercise, and nutrition. We look at the psychology, we look at the science, we look at the behavior, and how it can shape your fitness lifestyle. So take a listen, we will peel back the onion, we'll fall down the rabbit hole, and we'll make sure to hop back out and give you some stuff that you can take away and apply right away. We hope we can help guide people along their fitness journey as they continue to strengthen their body, mind, and spirit. This week, the episode topic is functional training and i want to start us off with a little definition i found from a blog post from eight fitness in many respects functional strength training should be thought of in terms of a movement continuum as humans we perform a wide range of movement activities such as walking jogging running sprinting jumping lifting pushing pulling bending twisting turning standing starting stopping climbing and lunging all these activities involve smooth rhythmic motions in three cardinal planes of movement sagittal frontal transverse training to improve functional strength involves more than simply increasing the force producing capability of a muscle or group rather it requires training to enhance the coordinated working relationship between the nervous and muscular systems. Thoughts, guys, on that definition? Very uh, comprehensive in its explanation. I would I would agree with w- what came out in the first sentence, which was it's a <laughs> continuum of basic continuum. You know, human movements. And I they, love that. They went off yeah. to yeah. explain all the different types of human movement. Uh, uh, each plane of motion, I would argue, through... Um, multiple or all three planes of motion simultaneously for true authentic functional movement um but again it Mm. my only thing i would add is Mm. for me functional functional training should just be relative to what it is you're looking to be more functional at doing that could be bodybuilding and we can get into that later down the road which i'm sure we will that is a a, yeah sorry go ahead eric it's a it's a great definition but it's very very broad of where you can go with that. And I, I like Mike's definition you just said at the end. And and that's what people need to look at because it gets such a bad rap of this functional, what we think is functional training nowadays. You know, you have to be able to do handstands and, you know, jumping jacks in the same sequence. It's like, no, you don't have to. Um, and I know we'll get into that. I, I think um, Mike kind of hit the nail on the head with the functional – defining the def- the functional aspect is just related to whatever it is you're trying to functionally improve. Um, Cause yeah, it can be a wide variety of things. And I think that's why the definition has to be in a way it's specific and in a way it's really broad. Um, but, you know, I remember just getting into arguments with, with people being, you know, well, everything's pretty much functional if you can have a right, definition to it or, or attribute it to something in some way yeah. um i guess it's i guess it's not functional um when it has no application right um so yeah let's or that they just had one definition of it and they didn't want to let go what they thought functional training was true 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 which i think so, a, it happens a, a lot more than people think i don't think people would know the under or understand the definition of like functional training and what it means so let's let's dive into each three of us real quick. Eric, how do you like to train, um, and how is yours functional? How how is the way that you train functional to what you try to improve in your body and your performance? I balance out my systems, the human the systems of the human body, to be able to respond to the environment around it and respond to what I need my body to do. So I'll take the the three plane, the tri planner. It says an ace. Give me that all day. I make sure I'm hitting all planes of motion through exercise and basically daily life and be able to be able to move successfully successfully through space in those planes 
and not have issues or compensations, injuries, impingements. That's how I look as functionality. So Functional, I put that, yeah. yeah. So I put that to my training, and you know, build full full body programs, or we can break it down by planes: sagittal plane, transverse, frontal. You know, neural control, motor control, locomotion. Add that all in. That's how I program for most of my clients. So they can be exceptional at everyday living, walking, running, walking upstairs. You know, if they fall, they slip, they can figure out what to do. But it's a, it's a variety of, of all of that, of all the ways that you program with the sagittal plane and what type of movement you're trying to control. You make sure you incorporate basically a, a, a wide variety. Every, every session, someone's getting a sagittal, tr- frontal, transverse plane movement, and they're going to master My that. My own training, yeah. Okay. And then Mike, how do you, and, and not even, and not even just with your clients, but even if the way that you train, how is, yeah, exactly. Like how is your training, what you do functional to what you want to improve? My training has to, um, improve the function of my performance is how I would define it. So, um, I want to be able to perform better in whatever activity that I'm doing. And so my, my selections whether that be the, and a lot of people think of functional training and they think of just the exercise, the exercise or the movement portion of functional training. And when I think of it, I think of it more from a performance standpoint. So movement is just one aspect of, let's take jujitsu, for example. That's what mm-hmm. I'm heavy into now and preparing for a competition in about three weeks. And so my movement right has to obviously be very three-dimensional there's i'm on my i'm on the ground in fact most of the time after you know we start in standing and so i need to be able to function through movement properly through a very three-dimensional field uh through varying degrees of strength because i'm you know unlike a uh take a uh cable stack or a dumbbell something that's a fixed weight that i'm moving um, it's, it's one level of resistance. And so I'm, when I'm, uh, you know, grappling with another human being, there's going to be varying levels of resistance dependent upon the push and pull, you know, uh, intricacies of that type of dynamic. And so <clears throat> I'm looking at maybe doing some things like bands, right. That have variable resistance or uh, something along those lines for my movement. But I'm not only looking at movement, I'm looking at when I'm looking to improve my functional training, what is my recovery like, right? Recovery is a huge aspect of, um, of being able to perform better, right. To improve my performance, my energy systems. Exactly. So energy system, um, training has to be taken into account and that's absolutely probably, um, maybe even a more functional aspect of the training program, um, than the movement itself, right? Because the we talked about this in previous podcasts before of energy systems is that the aerobic capacity uh, has to be, you have to have an aerobic capacity of, as your underlying component of your training or, or else it doesn't matter how strong or how good I move um, if I don't have the ability to uh, withstand that energy system for a long period of time, which is, you know, five minute, five minute match. That's, that's, um, you know, entirely aerobic for the most part as, as a basis. So I'm looking at that and I'm looking at, you know, obviously my training is going to be geared towards managing those two things primarily. Um, but it's all for me, it's about improving my, my, the function of my performance through, you know, those two avenues essentially. Yeah. So you, Mike, you would have more functional training than I think me and Matt would. I would consider. Yeah, because like you're you you're you're, you're performing. Yeah. yeah, you're you're like you have a a regimented sport that you're performing for. Like mine, I think Eric and I can both agree. We kind of just do it for 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 daily improvements and weekly improvements on just kind of our long term goals, which is you know inevitably yeah. for me, it's always going to be trying to get stronger and trying to always. Um, and part of getting stronger is getting a little bit bigger, right? Like that's why we'll. Part of my um, accessory work may include some hypertrophy stuff to help grow the muscle, um, but but in in a way that my performance yours is like the jujitsu match, mine's more of like the the deadlift and the squat on the PR days. I'm incorporating the rest of my programming and my rest of my work that I do through the week to help me in in that realm and make me stronger in that realm and functional to that purpose. 
I would also say to though my my training, although it may be training for something specific right now, it's not too far departed from what you guys are doing. And so what I mean is like when I'm in jujitsu, I obviously there is a lot of bridging that you're trying to do, especially if you have somebody in a mount position and you're trying to, you know, essentially buck them off you and try to do a hip ex, hip escape and then re re uh, uh, re recapture a guard position so that you're in a safer, less dominant that they're in a you're in a more dominant position or neutral position. So for that, I'm doing a lot of you know deadlifting, hip hinging, uh, you know, more ballistic stuff like kettlebell swings and things like that that are going to help me with that explosive hip movement because that hip movement is going to translate very well. Um, to improve the function of my performance in jujitsu, right? So that's absolutely something that um, I'm including in my program. So it's not so far departed as you may think. I'll give you another example. Um, gripping, and especially in the gi, when you want to um, grab either the, the lapel or the the um, sleeves or the, right. the, the, the um, right. sleeve of the, uh, the gi, yeah, or, or, or anywhere, the pants, uh, there is a lot of grip involved on, on, on heavy, thick fabric. So uh, a lot of things I'll do if I'm doing some sort of grip-related type of endurance grip, you know, where I'm holding on to something for a long time, like I may be grappling with somebody and really gripping the Ankle. gi or working on a choke yeah. with the gi. I may do, I may grab some towels, which are high fabric. I may do some kettlebell um, farmer's carries holding on to towels that are holding those kettlebells or even pull-ups where one hand is on the bar and the other one's on a towel. So I've this staggered grip or you know towel pull up straight to two hands um and it's very relative and um relative in improving the function of, of the performance that i'm looking for um specific to jujitsu so those are just some examples you know of how i would you know call it functional improving function i think in some ways um it's a little bit like when a teacher doesn't need to see the answer they need to see how you're explaining the answer in some ways, that's how functional is um, used, where people no, don't really have a really set way to understand what they're doing, but they can kind of connect it to maybe something they're doing in in their daily right. life. Um, but I think what's crucial is the part right. going into it, right? Like you talking about this, like you go into your deadlift probably knowing or thinking about how it's going to improve you in your jujitsu or you, or you, like you said, you go into doing pull-ups with a towel specifically to help you with that grip. So it's a little bit m more of uh, like law of specificity. Um, so I think when it comes to um, kind of finding this functionality, there's kind of two ways to do it. And I think the best way is when people can go into it kind of premeditated, you're going to get that much more out of it because you're primed to know that this is going to be helping me when the next time I grab this gi. And you might not even, you're not going to consciously think of it next time you grab the gi, but your body's going to be aware of that, that you've been training for that, that moment. Um, and I think, I think gripping, gripping fabric, right? Same response. The brain, the nervous system recognizes that pathway. Right. Exactly. Right. Now I think I think honestly I, I want to hear it like I'm kind of uh, interested as you know what wouldn't be functional training it would basically be someone going in just to get a workout in right and and not really thinking about the bigger picture and not really trying to apply this into an everyday life scenario I, I, that's what I'm I'm that's what I'm trying to get at is like how do we define non-functional training now well, I, I think all training is functional to a point like you're training your system, your metabolic pathways. I think where a lot of people get lost in the functional definition is what what are they doing to help longevity and help them move pain free? Right. Because I think that's where it kind of for me it gets confused because people like so say if Mike did a bodybuilding protocol and he wants to do jujitsu, ju he would still get function of certain lifts. But I don't think he would optimize his performance and his, resu his results because he would only be working in okay. a sagittal plane. Okay. So where all that stuff's functional, people miss planes, training certain planes. That's where function breaks down for me. And that's when if you are all sagittal exercises, squats, rows, bench, you know, and you don't get frontal transverse, that's so, not so functional in my eyes. 
So basically, that definition does need to be really wordy and does need to incorporate a lot of things because to be functional, you have to be yes. all encompassing or all inclusive, throw- essentially. But it's not, it's not to it's not to say that what you're doing isn't functional. It's just that if you're not, you know, thinking of the bigger picture or thinking of all the aspects of your movement in daily life, and you're not training right. to replicate that, then that's not completely you have functional to respect in its nature. In that definition where it says the planes, you have to respect that the body always moves in those three planes during all kinds of movement, no matter what. <laughs> and if you don't respect yep. that, okay. I. I would say it's not optimally functional for daily life tasks. All right. Well, 15 minutes in and we fully defined functional training. <laughs> now on to the good stuff. Well, no, I'm just it's kidding. back and forth. Um, no, I think it's important. I think it's really important to um, kind of discuss this and talk about the difference between the two because I think that – I think some people are lost when they hear functional training like, well, wait a second. Is, is what I'm doing not functional or – Oh wow! I got to go do more functional training. How do I learn about this? And you know, I think we're helping de- define that for people by saying that it's multiple planes of motion and it's representative of or representative. Yeah, is that the right word? Um, of what you're doing for the rest of your life. Unless you're a power lifter and want to get strong in the bench, squat, and deadlift, that's going to be your functionality realm. Now, most people are not going to live there. The average Joe that comes off the street is not going to be even close to that. So why would you put them on a a program like that? And that's where I think people get confused or they'll hear functionality and they'll think, oh, that's like CrossFit. I don't need to do handstands. I don't need to do, you know, bear crawls for 25 minutes. And I think that's where we see function go overboard when people think like they have to overperform and do stuff that they don't know how to do. And move in all these different movement planes and one exercise. And it's co- sort of like animal flow on steroids, I think, th- how people see it. Because the animal, flows, animal flow is great. How people view yeah, CrossFit, or, or you're saying? Functional training. People think it's only just, you know, body weight, animal oh, flow. You're okay. moving constantly. But it's really not. It's just how you implement that into a workout program. That'd be an interesting survey to go around and ask like a hundred people, what is functional training to you? And I would be interested in seeing what the, what the report back would be. And I, and my guess would be kind of like what you're saying, just like, Oh, it means like you're doing CrossFit or it means you're using a kettlebell or it means that, you know, you're doing burpees until right. you're, you're until failure. So it is, it is interesting when you try to break down like what, is the perception of of the outsider looking in what do they think i don't personally like the term and i try not to use it because it's almost one of those those buzzwords that people like they hear it and they're like nah i don't think i want that or i don't want to work out with you because you said that and i kind of already have my understanding with it so i always just say we're going to work full body triplanar everything develop you as a human being systems to go through the phases of gait and then you're going to be optimizing control but I think, I don't know, for, for me, functional is just people see it as going overboard. Well, let's, let's, let's break it down let's real quick and let's it. talk about Have some it, of the Avatar, different ways of yeah. training. Yep. Yeah. Let's talk about like CrossFit and bodybuilding, um, animal flow. Let's, let's go down the list of different types of training and what would make it functional and for like the type of person, I guess, right? Like, like the develop the profile for that, that type of training yeah. who it would best be for. Yeah, and 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 then a bunch just, of gymnastics decide on one that it wouldn't be best for, which should should be pretty easy. Fire yeah. them off. So let's start off with just the, the list runner. of of oh. training that we'll talk about. So we'll talk about CrossFit, okay. talk about bodybuilding. What else do you want to put in there? I mean, we can um, aerobic gymnastics. I want to throw gym. Yeah, I like it. So Cycling. like a long distance, and then what's another profile we got? We got CrossFit, bodybuilding, gymnastics, marathon runner. Um. Maybe we just have, um, maybe we just have the the general pop, general population, um, kind of inconsistently going to gym, not really going on a program, just doing workouts when they go in. Where do you want to start? Good old bodybuilding. I know Mike does. I know you do, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's he's chopping at the bit over there. You hear him. <laughs> I love bodybuilding. I love bodybuilding. No, so okay. 
<sighs> Where do we even start? Let's go with all right. All right. So just first start with um, in what type of workout program is functional to a bodybuilder? Muscular size. So if your goal is to get bigger and just want to get bigger muscles, okay, not not stronger, not um, feel better, not feel uh, like you want to be more mobile, like most of the general population. Um, in fact, you may even get tighter if you're a bodybuilder. In fact, you'll probably get tighter. If so if you're okay with all those things and you just exclusively want to get bigger, no. If, but then, but then, you know, that is probably the most functional type of exercise for that specific purpose. Which is, you know, three sets of, of some type of hypertrophy training. Time under tension. Yeah, it's a lot of single joint movements. Yep. Constantly expanding and contracting that muscle fiber to create actin, actin myosin tears and sarcoplasmic uh, right. hypertrophy and, and all this stuff to just really make the muscle bigger. Then, yeah, lift, lifting like a bodybuilder. Yeah. Right, right, right. Then that is functional training to that type of person. If you are the bodybuilder who does do you, and remember, you're sacrificing mobility. You probably are going to sacrifice strength, um, but that type of training, what we just said, the single plane mo- motion, the single joint movements, um, that is functional to that profile. Okay, and then something, hey, we got to throw in here too because I just thought of this. We, we're talking about like a lot of different extremes here. So like as you just said, Matt, if you, if you move in one direction, you move further away from something else, right? Like you rob Peter to pay Paul. So maybe we can think as we go through these, get to a point where we think about, well, what is that one modality of exercise type that can maybe give us a little bit of everything? If that makes sense, like, like I know I'm not going to be perfect in, in everything because that's not possible, but mm-hmm. what's going to give me a little bit of everything? What style of working out? Because that's probably our gen pop, right? Exercise competitors. Well, let's, let's answer that at the end, right? That'll be for the end. Um, okay, so we covered bodybuilding. Let, let's go on to CrossFit and who that's functional for. Athletes, military. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And ver- very geared towards like you just said, like people who want to compete and kind of have that team aspect is geared towards that. Now, also you have to realize it's got to be geared towards if your body can handle that kind of extreme stress on a system. It's, it's, it's my demand. Of- okay. So you're talking about the down, the, you're talking about the negatives being that if you're, if you're trying to be a functional training for a CrossFit type of um, activity, whether you're competing or you, whatever, want to just have that type of uh, endurance you're saying that um what are the what are the downfalls to that so he's gotten asked this question before <laughs> every client should i do crossfit eric <laughs> what are you reading this from a textbook that was well very well articulated thank you yes <laughs> <laughs> i guess i guess yeah that's a good point that's a good point yeah Um, yeah. And I think, I think, um, when I think of CrossFit as who it maybe shouldn't be for, as I wouldn't put somebody into a CrossFit type program who may, um, just need to move better and needs to lose weight. I don't think that person and that profile is functional for, because you're going to sacrifice everything just to get them into their goals but you could also be impeding their goals because of injuries and, and high risk of, of injury risk. Right. And, and just focusing on different things right. that don't need to be improved on if they're right. working on weight loss and like lower body movement first. Like I don't need somebody to have an overhead press or uh, be able to snatch uh, their body yeah. weight before they can't even properly, you know, hip hinge or you know, get the right Correct. ankle and mobility the, for a And squat. with the stimulus of the the, um, the wads, the workouts of the day, if they're always changing and always like variety, does that person actually get trained in one aspect? Mm. So here's the other question. Is it actual actually functional if you're not doing repetitions over repetitions and actually getting better at something and training your muscles to be metabolically demanding of 
cleaning and jerking and doing 100 push-ups where the next day you're not even touching push-ups and you don't do push-ups for another week. Like, are you really that functional? And ba- and basically what we just told you to do, audience member, if you're interested in CrossFit, is you need to do your homework on the CrossFit gyms in your area because it is so hit or miss. And there are some amazing coaches and facilities out there who really do a good job about making their programs work on a broader scale with mesos and, my, and macros and phasic training. And there are other CrossFit gyms that are just trying to churn and burn and just get numbers in and out the door. And they don't really care about that phasic style training or working on improving movement patterns um, and, and different goals of individuals over a bigger uh, time frame. So guys, here's my, uh, here's my relative quote to CrossFit of what Eric just said of, you know, not not doing a whole lot of, um, uh, you know, the, the same exercise, you know, to get that, that level of adaptation. Um, this is a Bruce Lee quote and you, you know, you've heard it. I fear not a man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And I think it's very relative. And, um, if you guys, obviously, you know, who Dan John is, if anyone on here, uh, doesn't know who Dan John is. He's one of the most highly regarded strength coaches um, in the history of strength coaching. I mean, just a phenomenal resource and a, a gem to our uh, our industry. And one of the things that I really Ooh. gained from his books, and it was either Intervention or Never Let Go, one of his first two, he talks a lot about the difference between repetitions versus repetition. And so it's very relative, I think, to you know, like what Eric was just saying, which is, um, and this quote, in fact, Doing, doing, uh, you know, twenty different things one time is not going to be as beneficial as doing one thing twenty different times, and so I, I think when we look at that, simple is uh, most of the time better when it comes to looking for a specific quality of of your training or some specific function of what you're training, um, and and I would say even more so when it comes to the strength athlete athlete or the strength, uh, you know, it's like power lifter, somebody who's focused on just getting as strong as possible, um, doing less is, is, and just doing multiple repetitions. So in other words, um, we can, we can take the analogy of somebody who exercises. Um, would you think that somebody would get a better, um, physical, uh, let's, you know, better, better physical results if they were to work out for three hours on a Saturday, or if they were to work out one hour on Monday, one hour on Wednesday, and one hour on Friday? Same time throughout the course of the week, right? But repetition as opposed to amount of, uh, you know, repetitions within one period. I mean, the obvious answer is those is the pe- person who's working three days a week, working out three days a week. So, I mean, that's just another great analogy to, to understand this concept. I think it's very relative to, uh, to, to CrossFit in that case, you know, because they don't really repeat a whole lot of things and you never really get to get good at it. Um, not bashing yeah. CrossFit, just saying, you know, really... it's, it's, as we get into these other yeah. types of training modalities, you can start to see the relevance of why they actually work very well from a periodized standpoint. And it's just important to recognize this stuff. That's really what we're trying to do is just highlight this stuff so that people can be aware of it, right? We're not, we're not here to bash anything like that. We're just here to help people we're understand running. why certain things um, cause certain effects in general, in general population or across the Absolutely. board. Absolutely. But um, let's, do, let's do the type of training that would be functional for a marathon runner, marathoner. Obviously running, you know, you have to have that in. Um, well, because <laughs> running, running is still functional. Uh, running is functional okay. gait pattern. You have to have it. And I think a lot of people only think as a hey, functional training is, you know, doing these crazy movements with weights. No, functional training is going running sprints, running um, up hills, treadmills, well, stairmasters, whatever. <sighs> That's where I would start with a marathon runner. And then obviously I would train in the program of strength training is training the phases of gait. So alternating, reciprocating movements of the upper body, lower body. Oh man, we got rather the scientists than, here. Rather today. than only sagittal, because that locks them in their position. They're never going to be Eb, yeah. in that locked right. position. No, I'm yeah. not saying. And one one thing that is functional too is um, training the uh, concentric phase. Only the concentric phase of of lifts um, in terms of the lower body. I remember. I'm hearing about this with Mo, the marathon runner in, in Boston, and he had or Meb, yeah, and he had to uh, 
he had to improve his time, but he really couldn't do anything with his pace. So they looked at his force production into the ground. So the way, and he, he eventually did get the improved time that he wanted without adding any size onto the system, right? Like you still want that motor to operate at its efficiency. You don't want to have to throw any more weight on it. So what they did was they did um, concentric deadlifts. So he just picked up weight and dropped it and just kept doing that. And, you know, obviously the, the whole idea is just creating a better force production into the ground without getting any actin myosin tear, which would then cause the muscle to, to probably grow and repair. Yeah, that's really interesting. I have used that um, specific like exercise prescription for people who, you know, may get sore or aren't focused on hypertrophy, but want more strength output or power output. Um, things like sled pushes or med ball throws against the wall or or med ball throws like through the air as long as you're not catching them uh, yourself. Um, all those concentric only phases, especially sled pushes, are great for that type of um, power or strength output without the you know eccentric loading that that you know happens on the body. So great points there. And I think that would be more functional for a marathoner because they want to maintain, they want to be strong, they want to maintain their speed. Um, but they, I mean, come on, like. 15, 20 years ago, you ask a marathon runner if they go to the, the gym, they're like, no, I don't want to get too big. Like they were, people were too afraid to touch weights. They thought it was going to add weight, add size, and then create uh, issues for their running. When in reality, you want that fiber, that muscle fiber to be able to withstand running for 26.2 miles. So you want it to be strong. You just don't want the added yeah oh yeah the 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 top performing marathon runners know that they needed to be lifting into a gym even 20 years ago i would also say this uh, running probably has in my opinion the most uh everyday like joe and jane uh, real life application more than any other uh type of modality we're talking about here because and here's here's what i'm going to explain um think of yeah think about uh on the on the African plains, for example, right? The wildebeest that's the biggest and strongest wildebeest is not the one that's going to escape the lion. In fact, he's probably the one that's going to get tore up by the lion. It's the fastest ones, right? The Absolutely. ones who are young and are are the freshest and the you know they have the strongest legs and the ability to 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 whisk away quicker than anybody else. It's the slower ones that the ones that get eaten. And so, if you're in a real world, you know, um, a situation where it requires you to get the hell out of somewhere because there's trouble happening, if you can run fast, that's probably the best defensive mechanism that you can. Exercise exercise at that moment in time. Um, especially, you know, if there's other people around you who are slower than you, you're probably going to escape, you know, you know, trouble, uh, much easier than everybody else. And so I think the real world application of running and being a fast runner is, is really high from a real world application standpoint. I agree. I agree. And one thing that I want to look at, uh, I want to bring up right now um, I have no basis for this at all, right? I just have a dog and I've been thinking recently. Um, but if you see a dog sit, you see their whole foot go flat. You see a dog run, they're up on the, essentially their ball of their feet. So think of that in terms of a human being. They stand and they're standing on their heels. Yeah. When you run, most often, most often than not, when you sprint, is different than when people can run sometimes. A lot of people are heel strikers, but when people sprint, you'll sometimes just see people like almost like gliding on the ground just on the balls of their feet. And I I almost think that we were meant to be in that position and that's what the foot is meant for, more so than flat-footed and on our heel. Thoughts? So shorter bursts like more sp like sp sprint and stop sprint and stop sprint and stop yeah more springy and, and and more yeah and more that tension going into the muscle rather than the, the joints well well that's if think about uh the hunter gatherers think about the hunter gatherers stalking an animal right you're moving really slow creeping through and then boom you may have to like you know go on a dead sprint and throw an arrow through you know, through the torso of a, a deer or something, you know, um, and, and then, okay. And then we're back to walking and resting again. So I think it's very relative. Yeah. I, I think, I think what, one thing I would look at is, um, is it because we, 
we were supposed to be like that on all fours and then kind of through evolution we stand up and then we end up standing on our heels and that foot almost becomes useless like the coccyx or um other structures in our body that really don't have like the much midfoot role. becomes useless but, you know yeah, essentially, when when you're when you're walking flat footed, the midfoot really isn't doing any work. You have 26 bones in your foot. Yeah. Are they really doing a lot of work or are they doing more work when you are essentially raised up on the toes and ball of your foot and you feel your calf working more and you feel your, you know, that flat, uh, kind of the oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The arch kind of taking some more of that tension away. You know, I know. You know see what I'm so saying? You're saying over time I get you. We have screwed up the gait pattern. We to put us we, into we, poor performance exactly. and poor positioning that we're taking aspects out of our normal functioning human system. Well, we, I think we forced evolution to protect the fact that we had to not get eaten by some of these faster animals on four legs. So we, I think we almost forced bipedal movement <laughs> earlier than we were designed for. And when you stop and look at the rates of people with hip <laughs> issues and knee issues, um, I don't know. It just makes me think, were we meant to be bipedal 100% of the time? I don't know. You went from the foot to bipedal. <laughs> so just a thought. Just a thought. But let's get back Let's get back to the topic at hand rather than evolution. So we're going to go back to types of training and what would, what would and wouldn't be functional with um, – we were talking about the marathoner. So, you know, you know, the type of training we kind of can explain that what wouldn't be functional for a marathon runner would probably be, I would say, your CrossFit style workouts, your bodybuilding style workouts. Those would not be functional for a marathon runner. No, or, or hypertrophy training really. You don't want to add a bunch of muscle – Right, right, right. That's what I'm going to say. Not, not bodybuilding training, but hypertrophy training. Right, right. No, I mean, look, it, it, all it takes is any, in any sport, right? We can look at any sport and well, who is the top level athlete in that sport? What does their physique resemble or look like? That'll give you an idea of right now, what is the optimal, um, you know, body for that, you know, for success in that sport. If you look at high level um, Olympic sprinters, 100 meter sprinters, they're all just oh my gosh they're all quads and glutes yeah you know just yeah beasts like muscular beasts right but if we look at the top okay. kenyan runners or meb you know for example of our marathon runner completely different physique completely different body and that's because there's completely different requirements to excel in that sport let's go to bodybuilding you know you've got bodybuilding you've also got crossfit look at i mean crossfit looks like a scaled down version of a bodybuilder in a way um bodybuilders look nothing like powerlifters right so we've got all these different types of body types and we look at you know does um you know the mountain right who we know is like one of the world's strongest men does he look anything other than just some, a guy who can lift a car up over his head. Like he, like essentially the body is going to adapt to the needs and demands of the function of that sport. And I think that that's where we get into to functional training and looking at it. Like the, the, the high level people who are training at a, a serious volume to perform that sport. Um, I was just watching, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who's the uh, free solo uh, climber who just who did El Capitan in uh, Yosemite, I, f I forget his name. Uh, Arnold, Arnold, I th Arnold. This is his name. Whatever. He, uh, you know, very thin guy. Very, you know, very thin. You don't want to carry a lot of weight as you're f free soloing up the side of a mountain. Um, huge forearms that are probably just as thick as his biceps because of the grip. That's and and all this is very relative to what he does. It's very functional know, um, to carry over into what he's doing point is the body type is is really uh really a, a a great indicator of what the necessary goods are to be a top performer you know in that um, respective sport yeah and and i think we just had a long pause because we've just said pretty much everything we needed to say and um it's it's really representative of how I would assume you two as well, how I conduct my assessments and how you guys can conduct your assessments. Cause it's always kind of about like, all right, well, you know, what do you want to get? What do you want to accomplish? Okay, cool. What have you been trying to do to accomplish that? Okay, cool. Well, uh, 
let's see what your body does and let's see what your starting points are, body measurements, all that stuff. And now let me tell you the solution now to get to where you want to go based upon our starting point. So it's just, it's, it's cool because we're basically trying to help people kind of qualify how they should train to make it more functional and make it more representative of what they want to do. And thus we'll actually get them that get them to their goals. Well, so I want to say this, um, and I, I don't want to turn this into a bashing uh, personal trainers session, but that being said, uh, well, that being said, do you, have you guys seen some flaws in the way people program or, you know, have you, have you kn- knowing context of wh- how this trainer is training that person? Cause I really hate to, you know, glance over at a trainer who's training somebody and see something absolutely ridiculous, but I don't know anything about the client. So I'm very hesitant to judge in those moments, but knowing some sort of context about that client, maybe have you seen some trainers kind of go about it the wrong way on how they approach their training programs before? <sighs> I mean, I mean, yeah, but here's the thing is like, if, if you're trying to do X, Y, Z with a client, but your client's like, no, I want to do, you know, a, and you're like, okay, let's do a little bit of a, you know what I mean? Like, all right, well, let me just, let's do X, Y, Z in the beginning of the session. We'll save some time at the end and we'll do some a, which is usually like bicep curls or what tricep extensions or something, whatever. Right. So it's like, it's tough to judge being the outsider looking in and i've learned that kind of over the years that i shouldn't really judge a book by a cover like i'm not even focusing on anybody else in the gym except for my client anyway um but you know i think there's i think there are a lot of young trainers who come in and they sort of copy and paste what was working for them uh across the board to all their clientele And that starts to drive me crazy because in the end of the day, a personal trainer is about putting the other person's needs and goals ahead of anybody else. So as a trainer, you should be at least able to have a working brain to ask somebody what their goals are and then know what you need to do as the professional to allow them to get to those goals. Do you think though that, you know, uh, and I've made the mistake of uh, being a young, naive trainer, first, second year, and allowing my client to dictate how I go about training them. And mostly it's because I just, you know, I didn't know any better. I didn't want to lose them as a client. And so I would try to appease them, you know, and say, oh, yeah, so yeah, we'll do some curls, even though they had like this huge gut and all they wanted to focus on was losing fat. But they, you know, I knew that, you know, doing deadlifts and squats and doing, they're not going to feel it like they're going to feel that bicep burn at the end of the workout and, you know, just putting some weight on a bar and letting them curl it you know, was going to make them was like stroke their ego a little bit, make them feel like they did something because it, it kind of took them back to how they worked out when they were on their own and so on. But I also feel like as a fitness professional, it's extremely important to um, make sure that the client understands that they came to you because you were the person who is going to help them get to where they want to go. And so you have to, they have to put their trust in you. And until they, until you prove that to them that you can't, um, you know, hack it, you know, as, as a trainer who's putting together this program for them, that's going to get them to their goal. Then I don't think that they should really have much to say in it, you know, to, to an extent, right. Again, a business is a business is a business. Right. I think it's a little bit of a give and a take. Well, sure. yeah, I think it's a little bit of a two-way street as well. I mean, I would definitely answer um, yes to your question. I see. I see because I think we've all seen it. Yeah, I think you need to be in control of that hour. I think the trainer has to be in but control I would say of that hour. For, even for trainers listening, you know, you have to look at – and like I – same thing as Mike. I've seen myself do stupid programs. I've, I shouldn't say stupid. Programs I don't think are efficient enough for my client. And I'll look back. I'll be like, I wrote this. I think even trainers, if they're listening, you got to step back and look at what is the best thing that you can do for your client and how can you help them the best through the knowledge you know, you've heard, you read, and where could you be selling them short? Because I mean, there's some times where I'll make a program and I'll be going through it halfway through and I'll be like, so this isn't just a good program. I'm not liking it. I'm going to change it up to give them what I think they need more of and it's going to benefit them more. I, I love uh, – so – 
going through TRX training, and uh, you guys know Charlie Weingroff. Um, and he was talking about, you know, when it comes to exercise selection, he's like, I don't care what you choose for an exercise to get the job done. He's like, as long as it gets the job done, you know, if you have a goal of getting this person's active straight leg raised to 90 degrees, I don't care if you if you smear peanut butter on his hamstring and he gets him to 90 degrees, he's like, then use it. And he's like, that's functional. You know, if it works, it's functional. He's like, if it doesn't work, he's like, you know, try again. You've guessed wrong. Try again. Do something that works. Then it's functional. Like, and it just, you know, he makes a great point. Like, I'm not going to go around, you know, taking them literally and smearing peanut butter on my clients. Um <laughs> But at that, to that regard, I'm also, as I said before, yeah. I'm not going to judge somebody because they're doing something that I've never seen before with a client that I think has absolutely zero application you know, for what they're trying to accomplish. There may be something I don't know about. There may be that this person had a hip um, uh, surgery and they have a limited range of motion in that hip. And that's the only way that that trainer can do that exercise with that person, right? So I, I'm, I'm going to be very hesitant to judge in those moments. I'm also probably going to pull that person aside and say, Say, hey, you know what? What are you doing there? What are you trying to? What? What? What's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish with that? And if I feel like there may be something better, I'm going to take that as a coaching moment and say, hey, that's great. Why don't you try this one too? I've found that this one works really well for me. If you don't think it works, you know, you, okay. if you think it works, use it. If you don't, throw it out. Don't don't use it. But and I usually will say it like that because I don't want people to feel obligated or that I really feel like my my. Um, you know, selection is better than theirs or that it's yeah. better than anybody's, right? It's just, hey, here it is. If you think you could use it. Yeah. No, but, that, but that's part of your job. That, but part of your job is to, right, help develop younger trainers. So that's why you should be focused on stuff like that. And you should be, and you are, and it sounds like you are really good at being open-minded about that. But that that's, I guess, kind of a little bit of a difference though. It's like, I'm not really looking at other people because I don't really have anybody to manage that I need to manage, you know? Um, but I think also too, it's important to recognize is that, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I may, I still do program things where I, I look back and I'm like, man, why would we do that last week? Or why did I pair this with that? And, and I feel like it's, it's a constant improvement and a constant growth and it's a constant, um, being proud of your work, but kind of never satisfied at, at something you're never, you're never hitting perfection. You're always striving perfection, but you're never going to say that you got something perfect because then that, then you would stop. So the point of the process is to continually grow and learn. So I think for anybody listening, like everybody still does it. And I think that's important to, to recognize it, it's, it's okay to recognize when you didn't do a, a good program. It means you make an adjustment and move forward. You don't bask in it. You don't, you know, power through it, but you have to recognize it because in order to get those great programs or walk away from a session and feel just so great and just look at your client broken and bruised on the ground, sweating, crying. No, I'm just kidding. But that, that you know, looking at a happy client who had a good workout and you, you say they feel good, having those sessions like that require those sessions and times of being like, wow, this program sucked or, you know, this workout was bad or stuff like that. So I think that's important to recognize. Yeah. What do you guys say to this? So you've got um, you've got people from different camps, right? We got sometimes you have trainers who say, you know, I only do functional exercises with my clients. So you know, we don't do pull downs or we don't do bench press. We only do pull ups and we do you know weighted push ups. What do you guys say to that when it comes to oh you know you know people who say like a bench press isn't functional or a pull down isn't functional. Uh, what do you typically say to that? Or how do you, <laughs> how do you, uh, because there are people who, who come from that camp, you're right. Who says, Oh, there's no, you know, bench press just isn't functional. So I never do bench press with my client. Um, and you, it's, it's not going to be functional if you don't, if you can't connect it to something else that you do. So if you can, as long as you can connect it to something else that you do and you think of that while you're doing the movement, then it'll p apply itself <laughs> that to that. It was hooked to the ceiling. To that uh, <laughs> real world scenario. But if you go through it and you're thinking that as you go through it and then maybe yeah. later you're like, oh, I guess, you know, my bench press is actually kind of like my basketball pass. And I guess my <laughs> lap pull down was kind of like when I, I don't know, grab something from the top shelf or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> That was hooked. That was hooked to the ceiling. <laughs> um, but if you think, it, it, yeah, right, you had to rip out of the ceiling. You had to remove your ceiling they, fan. I don't know. They look at um, it because it's 
if you think of it after the fact, then yeah, it wasn't functional. But if you were tr- thinking of it in the training phase, right, in the practice mode in the gym, then it's going to apply outside of the gym when you're in. And say your they don't scenario. think it's functional as like. Or the bench press, you know, you're you're on your back, you know, you're just pushing one direction, pull downs, you're just those exercise functional. So say you want well not even breathing, that. Just, just take a dumbbell, like take the bend the bar away. You have two dumbbells. Now if you alternate and reciprocate at the same time, that's like running gate pattern. That's alternating rib cage and moving. There's your bench press functional. For a pull down, take one dumbbell away. Give him one dumbbell. Yeah. Take one down. And for the pull down. Get in a squat, get unseated, same thing, alternate. You're running your rib cage through the gate pattern. It's just like running on a treadmill. And that's what I tell people is like, you don't, if I can make an exercise functional by making it single arm and you alternate back and forth, then it's going to apply to whatever, it's going to apply to them walking down the stairs and walking out the window. And they're like, or, okay, I guess it's functional now. See, so, I mean, you can, you can change every exercise to make it more functional. To yeah. make it functional. And that's what yeah. I love to do. So, and this is perfect. We've got 10 minutes left. And we, you asked that question in the beginning about what would we look at oh, for a general population. And then we, that was the only type of training we didn't talk well, about for general population. So let's spend the last 10 minutes talking about functional training for your everyday average Joe. And Jane. There's Janes out there. Average Joes and Janes. That's right. That's right. Just and you're not average. Before. You're all special to me. So what do you want to start? Like, what functionality do you want to start? Warm up? What planes? Well, I think I think it's just important to to you know we talked specifically about a bodybuilder. We talked specifically about a crossfitter. We talked specifically about a marathoner. And we talked about specifically about how the training would re- be representative of functionality based upon those three profiles or those three. I I would start here. I think the one thing that a general population person or client needs would be some gross mobility. A lot of what we talked about in those different types of um, forms of exercise or, or modalities, um, for example, I don't care to an extent, I don't care what type of upper body mobility a marathon runner has, right? Or even lower body mobility for that part. I, some of the distance runners I've worked with have some of the tightest hips, lower bodies, calves I've ever seen. And they're very good runners, very good runners. There's a very small range of motion that they're working in. Now a sprinter, completely different. That reciprocal angle of the of the you know opposite hips is ex- is much more exaggerated, right? So they need a much much more mobility through their hips. But then and and upper body as well with the upper body you know moving hips, reciprocally. Yeah. Uh, but then when you good look point. at you know That's a great uh, the everyday Joe yeah. Jane, they do have a much more um, gross mobility requirement. You know, it, it, it requires getting up out of bed, bending down and tying your shoes, or like you said, reaching up into the cabinet or, you know, bending over with a twist to, uh, I don't know, take your slippers off. You know, there's, there's all different types of movements. And I know, again, everybody else does those things, but if we're talking about the everyday Joe Jane, um, that needs just general requirements. I would say gross mobility is probably one of the things that should be a very, very much a main focal point of that person's program, right? And especially because the majority of people are sedentary. And and I so, should have well, specified. Roger, exactly. I was just going to say, and that's exactly what I was going to say. It's just, I, I should have specified that when I, when I say general pop, I'm thinking of somebody who has a nine to five, who's probably sitting 30 to 40 hours a week, just at work, not even including drive time, travel time and, you know, eating dinner and sitting on the couch. So I, right. I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, just getting these movement patterns back in your life because that's what you're lacking and you're stuck in a sedentary phase. Um, yeah. so just something as exactly. basic as getting that movement Step in all different planes of motion yeah. and getting good quality range of motion. Um, that goes a long way just for our general pop without even touching yeah. a weight. So, yet. so in a program, it would look, I, I, what I gather from that, what it looked like is, you know, single leg stance right in front, right leg stance, left leg stance, crawling, um, lateral step ups, all kinds of planes, you know, rotating up top, rotating the trunk, rotating each arms. When I program, that's what I look at is, is how can I add this stuff into exercise to make it more yeah. tri planar rather than just one plane? Like you sit on a machine and do 
uh, a leg curl, you know, that's just one plane of motion. But if you get on a slider and add rotation up top, you can get a couple different planes and add some rotation of the legs in. That's a completely different exercise in my book. And you're just restoring that mobility. So when they actually do pick up a weight or want to go deadlift, lunge or whatever, they have that control through those muscles. Yeah. And, and another great point with our gen pop people is you've got, um, if we're just training muscles, like we're just doing sagittal plane bodybuilding style movements where we're single joint, you know, even, even multi multi joint, but we're not, not moving the whole body through that three dimensional field. I think that it's, if we're looking at what the majority of the everyday client needs, which is, um, a little bit more higher metabolic demand. They want the ability to burn fat probably a little bit more. And so that requires them to be moving much more, um, w with much more, uh, gross movement versus just, um, you know, ex like just muscles. Ver so in other words, muscles versus movements move going through uh, gross movement is going to be much more applicable, um, and functional for that person versus just training specific muscle groups. And so that's really the point I'm, I'm getting at is, um, you know, as Eric said, there's all these different types of planes of motion. I don't want to get bogged down in trying to define them all and all that, but, you know, twisting, rotating, bending, all those different things that, that a human body is capable of doing. If you look at a human body and the way the joints and everything are stacked and set up and how we're able to move, we're, we're able to move probably more um, three-dimensionally than any other animal on the planet. I mean, would you guys say yeah. that? I can't think of any other animal on the planet that is built the way we are to, you know, to be able to move to the capacity that we're capable of moving. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. The metabolic process. We, yeah. we haven't been able to detect it yet. If it exists, you, you, you're, I think you, the one thing I want to add into what you guys are talking about is just energy systems, because I think it's important to say that for the general population, functional training would be like being able to complete a thousand meter row under five minutes something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Because like I've seen it too many times where, um, people come for an, in for an assessment they've been working out four or five days a week, but as soon as you just tap into their aerobic system, they're shut down, they're lightheaded, they're, they're healing over and they feel like they need to go home. So I feel like a part of being functional, um, is going to be working not only in different planes of motion, but working your different systems. And when we talk about energy systems, we're just talking about the way your body partitions for fuel. Um, and, and kind of one last thing I want to make sure I touch on um, is I don't really know how to define this or state this, but people I see a lot of people use the BOSU as a way to improve their balance or your stability on a, on a, on an unstable surface, um, and it really only has a functionality for people who are typically finding themselves on unstable surfaces. Like if you're somebody who maybe you go on fishing trips a lot, um, that would make sense to be using something like a bosu to improve your um, stability into the ground. But for the most part. We're, we're walking, we're moving, we're, we're exercising, we're running, we're, we're on stable surfaces. So you want to improve your function on stable surfaces. That's going to be more functional in that aspect. And I, I don't know if there's any kind of, I guess, pet peeves or, or stuff that you guys see that irk you that you want to mention real quick. Uh, that was just one that I, I see a lot and I talk to a lot of people about that are, I'm like, well, are you ever on unstable surfaces, you know? So I, I had a physical therapist uh, give me a pr pretty good insight into that one, <clears throat> and it was, um, yeah, most of it's what you just said is we don't we're not really going to be functioning on an unstable surface underneath our foot, so to speak. Whereas we may be on a stable surface that moves, if that makes sense, underneath us. So so in other words, um, using like a wobble board versus a bosu ball where actually our foot is on is is on a stable surface but that stable surface itself is is capable of moving right um that's probably more real, realistic to what uh proprioceptive effects will probably encounter like in in the real world mm. versus like how often are you walking on sand right like not unless you live at the beach not very often where mm. you have to be on some sort yeah. of surface where the actual surface is moving underneath you. Most of the time, 
You know, it's, it's like, moving. you know, you're, you, you're hiking and you get on a rock and the rock moves underneath you, but your foot doesn't move on, you know, on the rock. It's the rock moving underneath you. So just, just something to think about that I thought was pretty good insight. Yeah. Don't stand on a stability ball. Don't try to balance and stand on a stability ball. You just look like a fucking idiot. <laughs> so did you have any, any, um, uh, things that you see in the, around the gym or yeah. are asked about that you want to clear yeah. the air on? <laughs> nah, just the stability ball stuff. Like I said, people who like kneel and try to balance on a stability ball. Um, I don't understand it. I mean, maybe there's something going on. I don't know about, um, why though what's the function what's the function of that is my question you know when are you ever going to be kneeling on something that's wobbling around like that and you need to you know stabilize your upper body i don't know of any also if you look at the bosu if you look at the bosu it says you're not supposed to flip it around you're only supposed to use the blue side so just for for people out there be careful because you can't sue the company anyway Again, when may you be on a boat that's moving around in the water and it's a stable board, surface maybe. that's, that's yeah, moving that's on really something it. unstable yeah. like water? <laughs> Probably much more likely, like I said the first, you know, a minute ago. So The uh, only things I can think of – I don't know if you guys had this at an overnight party. <laughs> Do you remember that dueling thing? You'd stand on it. It would be inflatable and there would be two platforms and you'd, you'd have the – so you're talking about you're gonna use the gym for that one scenario that you go I to a party? You. Yes, that's the only thing I can think of. Where you stand, function. Yes, I love it. I've been training three years for this. Other than that, not really. <laughs> I needed that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so. Eric, did you have any sort of tidbits or any uh, pet peeves that you've seen people kind of? I've seen a lot. Yeah, I just tell people don't go overboard. Don't don't take what you see on Instagram of these crazy workouts and try to replicate them because these people are very good at what they do out there. They're good. They're talented at these single arm, single leg, plyo push ups, all this stuff. You know, you can build up to it, but you just got to build the base because you're a walking human being. That's where you live. You're never going to be on these extremes. So that's how you should train. Yeah. And uh, doing curls in the squat rack will not add muscle to your biceps. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Proven. <laughs> it'll actually make people hate you more. Yeah. It'll, it'll actually make your legs bigger. If for those who are Proven. wondering. <laughs> <laughs> If you curl in the squat rack, your legs get bigger. It's really weird. Um, yeah, and, and basically, it, it's basically just just like uh, what we're saying. You know, Agreed. if you can, it's like back to a school exam. If you can explain your work, if you can explain how it's functional in your own head to what you're doing, what you're about to do, and you can think about it like that, then you're absolutely doing something that's functional in a way that's going to be representative of your everyday life or, or your whatever you be you're doing in your, in your other life. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Peace.